All right. Could you please give me your full name again as is recorded on your birth certificate? Vernon Eugene Ferris. All right. Um, do you currently or have you ever had a nickname, sir? Gene, G-E-N-E. -E. Okay. All right. Um, where were you born and raised? I was born in Weston, West Virginia, and I was raised in Jackson's Mill and Tampa, Florida. Okay. All right. Um, what did your parents do for a living? My father was a glass worker and a cabinet maker. My mother was a housewife. Okay. Um, you said you lived in Florida too. Did you guys have property in both places? We have property in both places. Okay. All right. I see. Um, was anyone else in your family involved in the military? Was your father ever? Or? No, my father wasn't in. I had an uncle in the CBs during the Second World War. Uncle in the Navy uh, during the Second World War, and I had an uncle in the Bataan Death March in Bataan. Uh -huh. That's the only ones I can remember. Okay. Um, where did you attend school at the most? Where did I attend school at the most? Hmm. Probably uh, Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Okay. Um, was there anything you'd like to describe about your childhood, possibly here in West Virginia and going back and forth to, to Florida? Or? Well, <laughs> I was raised in Jackson's Mill, and uh, well, actually, I was born in Shady Brook in a little brown house at the Shady Brook Schoolhouse, and evidently they have moved that house down over the hill to another location, I think on Monroe Street. Uh -huh. and. I was born at home, and the doctor, I think it was Dr. Mc, Dr. Corder delivered me, and uh, my father never finished paying Dr. Corder till he retired in the 1950s, I think it was, uh -huh. and he owed him $21 without interest. He ran an ad to paper to people to come in and pay their uh, bills. Uh -huh. uh, I was raised in Jackson's Mill. And my playmates were the Butcher Boys and the Johnses and the Haichu Boys. And uh, we used to go to Florida about every winter. My dad had a old three-quarter tons weapons carrier from the Second World War. We went to Brandon, Florida in 1940. And we carried everything we had in West Virginia down there just about, including the honeybees on the back of a truck. Uh -huh. We camped out and slept on the way down. We didn't have any money to go in a hotel. Uh -huh. And uh, a little joke my father used to say along the way was every time he stopped at a stoplight, he would have my mother to jump out and beat on the side of the truck. And the state police in Alabama pulled us over and stopped us and wanted to know why that my dad did that or my mother did that. And she told the state police, well, we have a three-quarter ton trucks and we got a ton of bees on the in the hives and I have to keep them flying uh -huh. for the weight. So uh, I went to school down in Florida in the sec part of the second grade, the fourth and the fifth, and uh, the sixth, and then I came back to Parkersburg, West Virginia, and went to seventh grade. I came back to Weston uh, in 46, 45, 46, and 47, I uh, attended uh, North School also in the first grade. Bonnie Compton and Anna Garrett was my teachers. Uh -huh. uh, I went six or seven months to school in Shady Brook. I went to school in Central. I spent junior high with Robert Blands as my history teacher in the ninth grade in Weston. And during the summers of 45, 40, or no, 46, 47, and part of 48, I worked at Jackson's Mill as a cook's helper under Kermit Weimer, uh -huh. which he taught me quite a bit. Uh, in the ninth grade, I uh, got discouraged with school. I was kind of adventurous type person, one to get out on my own. Uh -huh. So I tried to join the Navy when I was 16 and my mother wouldn't sign for me. So I uh, 
waited till I was 17 and come to Weston one day and just walked in the recruiter's office and uh, one of the boys that uh, used to live on Cottage Street in the same house I'm in now uh -huh. enlisted me in the Army. I uh, forget what his name is right now, but uh, they sent us to Fairmont and Lyman Clark and an officer swore three or four of us boys from Weston in and we went to Fort Knox, Kentucky uh -huh. and had our basic training. From basic training they sent us to a whole battalion to uh, open up Fort Carson or Camp Carson, Colorado then. It's called Fort Carson now. And while we were there, we had a great fire. It like destroyed half of the camp, burned up some of my friends. Uh, Colonel Works was our commanding officer. He had his hair burn off and his ears burned. And we learned to ski on wax straw in July. And then they took us to Camp Hill, Colorado and taught us to ski and mountain climb in the snow. Mm -hmm. And they was going to ship us to Alaska for a maneuver with the Prince Ca Canadian Airborne. Prince Patricia was the name of the Airborne. Anyway, uh, needless to say, all of our equipment, uh, winter equipment, burned up in the fire at uh, Camp Carson. So we had to wait for parkers and uh, skis and stuff before we could go to Alaska. Finally, they got us to Alaska and we forced landed in Great Falls, Montana, fire on the airplane. Uh, we got another plane and we landed in uh, Whitehorse, Canada, and we went on a four ski march for 250 miles. We skied 25 miles a day, bivouacked at night in the snow, just laid down, cut some pine boughs off the trees, throw the poncho over you, uh -huh. crawled in a double, double Arctic sleeping bag and took your clothes off inside. And you slept with your clothes inside the sleeping bag so they'd be dry and warm when you got up in the morning. Uh -huh. Uh, we used to carry our socks, extra pair of socks, because our feet was our most important things then. We used to carry our extra pair of socks in our armpits here, hanging so they'd be dry. Uh -huh. And we changed socks probably every six hours, mm -hmm. because the boots we had were thermal boots, and your feet sweat in them terribly, but yet they stay warm. So you had to keep your socks warm, uh, socks dry mm -hmm. and uh, we came back from that maneuver and we went to Fort Carson, Colorado and at that time we had the fourth mule pack outfit delivering us supplies in the mountains while we was rock climbing and mountain climbing. They taught us to evacuate people out of crashed airplanes and bring them down on litters on the, with ropes and stuff. Uh, the Korean War broke out in 19, June 1950, mm -hmm. and out of 148 men in my company, seven of us were shipped to Germany immediately, and the rest were sent to Vietnam, or I mean Korea, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many of them survived or never heard anything from any of them. I, do, I will say I was in the service with some of the uh, guys from West Virginia and Colorado as a a um, uh, Mr. Birchfield from mm -hmm. Crab Orchard, West Virginia, which I didn't believe there was a place called Crab Orchard, but there uh -huh. is down near Bluefield somewhere, Logan. Uh -huh. I was uh, a good friend, uh, Treadwell from Logan, one from Matt Twain, I can't think of his name, and one from um, a boy named Duncan. He was the, uh, what do you, you might call it, the uh, Beetle Bailey of our outfit. He kept everybody laughing. His name was Duncan. Uh -huh. And uh, from they sent uh, myself, uh, Private First Class Dupree, and a Sergeant First, or no, a Private First Class Evans. And one other boy was supposed to go, but he was killed during a hand grenade training session with my company commander, Captain Bush, in a foxhole in a uh, demonstration of how to throw a hand grenade. Mm -hmm. And three days we had to fire all the weapons we had before they shipped us out, regardless of whether you're going to Europe or 
uh, Korea. And uh, it so happened this boy from Orange Grove, Virginia, dropped a grenade in the hole and killed him and Captain Bush. And this boy, I don't remember his name, but he was on my orders to go to Germany. He didn't make it. Uh, they shipped us to Germany, and I think I was on the Hodges, one stacker. It took us 12 days to get there. Uh, then I came back on the General Taylor. It took us 10 days to get back. I went over again on the uh, uh, Buckner, I believe it was. No, we, I came back on the Buckner. I was shipped, uh, I was on the Rose and I was on the Patch. The Rose and the Patch were two stackers, which made it in five days instead of eight to ten days. Uh -huh. uh, we hit a storm one day uh, coming back on the General Hodges, it was supposed to be a jinx ship. Every, everything went wrong on that ship, uh -huh. what they told me, the Navy. Uh, then I married my wife in 1955 here in Weston, and we, I was stationed at Fort Meade, Maryland then. And the unit I was in, uh, in overseas, uh, the 2nd Army Cavalry Regiment, was I'd break my enlistment and re-enlist and then I go right back to the same company, mm -hmm. the same room and everything on the same post in Hamburg, Germany, which made it real convenient. I knew everybody and everybody knew me from the battalion, uh, regimental commander right on down, which at one time my regimental commander was Colonel Abrams, which was General George S. Patton's right-hand man in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a scene in the movie of Patton showing uh, the man that was playing uh, Colonel Abrams in, uh, they were supposed to ford a river with their tanks and they were sitting on a had a map on a jeep hood looking to see where was the most likely place they could cross mm -hmm. Will Patton's on the other side setting, setting up standing up in a jeep telling him to get the hell on over there there was a ford right down there about a hundred yards he said if you don't get over here right away I'll relieve you well, that uh, portion of the movie was Colonel Abrams at the time. Well, he was my commanding officer in Nuremberg, and we were stationed in Amberg, Bamberg, and Bayreuth along the Czech border, and our mission was to patrol that border 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and I'd done this off and on for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And while I was in that outfit, I was awarded a honorary Dragoon Certificate signed by General Abrams, or Colonel Abrams then. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I come back to the States. At one time we moved from Fort Meade, Maryland. We were in Germany, the second cab, and the third cab from Fort Meade, Maryland came over to Germany and relieved us, the whole unit. All they had to do was take over our tanks, our jeeps, and our equipment, and our weapons, and we got on the same train that they come in and went to uh, Bremerhaven got on the same ship that they got off of and the whole unit was shipped back to Fort Meade, Maryland, uh -huh. which made it real nice. And then uh, when my wife and I got married in 55 and we had our son, it, it was born in Fort Meade, uh, Maryland. Uh, let me think now, lose my train of thought. Uh, we were supposed to ship out from Baltimore. Well, I come to find out my wife wasn't nationalized. She was born really in Czechoslovakia to an American mother and a German father. Mm -hmm. But I met her here in Weston. She came over here in 1948 with her brother and mother. Her father was a German. He couldn't come over because he belonged to the Nazi party, which he was a school teacher, and you didn't teach school if you didn't belong to the party. Mm -hmm. So anyway, to make uh, her grandfather was one of the original finders, founders of West Virginia Glass. And anyway, I married here, and when we went to, uh, was supposed to go back to Germany on the ship again to relieve the third calf, I'm standing on the dock waving at the first sergeant. My son had got sick, and they put him in the hospital, so they pulled me off the orders. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I won't get to go to Germany. But then as soon as he got better, uh, three or four days later, why, they put us on a plane and took us to Baltimore. And we flew out of, or no, not Baltimore, New Jersey, I believe it was. We flew out of New Jersey. And uh, 
when we got over there, they had sent a advance party over there, and the sergeant was sponsoring me over there, had everything in my apartment set up, the bedrooms, the kitchens, pots and pans, dishes, everything was ordered. Our grocery list that we filled out in advance, all we had to do was move in the apartment and start breakfast. Uh -huh. Needless to say, I don't uh, like so much to mention about breakfast, but we had going over one time, we stopped in Shannon, Ireland, we had breakfast in uh, Ireland. We flew from Ireland. No, we left New York. We had breakfast. We had breakfast again in Ireland. Then we had uh, breakfast again in Nuremberg. And when we got down to Hamburg that and the next day, we had breakfast again. That was five breakfasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, after that, we I came back to the states and I was sent to Fort. Hood, Texas. From Fort Hood, Texas, we flew a whole battalion of us back to Germany again. Our over tanks and our equipment of that division, 3rd Armored Division, was right in Kaiserslautern, Germany, Germany mm -hmm. loaded with ammunition and everything. We was to fly over as a battalion, 1,500 men. When we got there, our tanks were loaded on rail cars already with ammunition. All we had to do is get in them and go to where we wanted to fight or train, and we'd go right into firing exercises on tank gunnage range. We'd drive them right off the rail cars and go into firing at targets that they'd pointed out to us. We stayed there for a month or two, and then we all flew back again to Fort Hood, Texas. Well, I got orders again in Fort Hood, Texas, I had applied for warrant officer school, and I was going to go to warrant officer school, and that didn't materialize. They cut orders and uh, sent me back to Germany. Well, I got over in Germany. I was with the 3rd Infantry Division, which was called the Audie Murphy Division during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, Audie Murphy was probably the most decorated soldier in the Second World War. Uh, well, he was really enlisted man. Uh, I stayed there for about two years, and then I got orders from the Department of Army because of Z-7, 8, and 9 got signed by uh, Secretary of Defense uh, to go to Vietnam. Uh, I believe that was in 66 or 67. Okay. 67, for, uh, yeah, 67 because we flew back to the States and I came here with my wife for 30 days, and then I uh, got on a plane and went to Pittsburgh, uh, Chicago, and then Oakland, California. And they shipped us out by plane from Oakland, California. And we landed in Oakland, California. And I shipped out of there on a plane the following day right to Vietnam. Somewhere I miss miss something because I went to Korea in 1963, and what it really amazed me was it was Wednesday for three solid days when you cross the international date line, and we were on the uh, one stacker. I know it was a one stacker uh, troop ship. We was on that ship for 21 days. We got off in Hawaii. We got off in Guam. We got off in Okinawa, we got off a few hours in Japan and then on to Korea, but it took us 21 days to make that trip. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, we landed in uh, Tonsonut, I think it was, and they kicked us all off the plane and loaded the plane with ammunition to uh, send out to uh, one of the uh, outposts up north was being hit hard. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't know anything about what was going on here. So we stayed in there, uh, that camp, for about a day. They put us, put me on a plane going uh, to Play Clue. Well, we landed in Play Clue, and here all down the runway was casualties on litter uh, being put on the same plane that we come in to be sent back to the States or to go to a hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, you get there and it was kind of dumbfounding like because I had never been in, through anything like that before. 
where do I go? There's nobody to tell you anything. Finally, an MP come up and said, Sergeant, can I help you? And I showed him my orders. And he said, well, you've got to go out to the main gate and stand there and wait for a transportation over to your unit and play Clue. Mm -hmm. And he said, I pray and hope you don't get hit going over there. I said, well, I do too. So finally, I did catch a ride with a uh, cook in a mess truck. He was coming there to get supplies for the mess hall. Well, he took me over to play Clue, and I reported to this uh, sergeant in the rear, and they indoctrinated me, and I'd never fired an M16 weapon before. We had always had M1s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but my orders was to go to 199th Light Infantry Brigade, which was in the Mel Condella, and I hadn't been in an infantry uh, outfit for almost 15 years. I'd always in the tanks or scouts. So I asked uh, the uh, instructor there in the room, I asked, is there anybody here over 38 years old? And I held up my hand. And he says, uh, is there anybody here with a profile? Meaning you had some kind of injury that might uh, uh, cause you to do harm to yourself or somebody else, you know? Mm -hmm. And I held up my hand. He says, what's your profile? And I said, hearing loss of high pitch sounds only. Mm -hmm. So he looked at me and said, what the hell are you doing over here? And I said, well, you tell me. I'm here. The Department of Army sent me here. Uh -huh. I said, I'm just doing what I'm told. So he said, well, Sergeant, he says, I don't think they can use you down that light entry brigade for all the noise and stuff you'll have to tolerate. So I said, have you got anything in armored or cavalry? He said, yes, we'll send you to... Uh, to play Clue, and you can go in a 10th Cav up there. Well, when I got up to the 10th Cav, uh, Colonel Buffalo Bill, we called him, he was our colonel, and incidentally, the 10th Cav I was in was the first black regiment in the cavalry in the old days, back when it was fighting Indians. Mm -hmm. So I reported to him, and he read my records and everything. He said, Sergeant, he says, I don't think we can send you out there in the jungles. And I said, well, I'm here, you got to send me somewhere. He said, well, how about you going down to the airfield there, and there's a Spec 5 down there and a couple corporals up in the tower, and see if you'd like to direct uh, uh, flights coming in and off of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Well, my goodness, I went down there, and I was hard hearing in a way, but you couldn't hear yourself think for the noise and the racket coming in on 20 radios in that tower. Mm -hmm. So I only stayed down there about 20 minutes and I come back and I say, Colonel, that's not for me. So he said, well, I'll send you out to B Troop out on Cav Hill that they're dug in out there. And he says, you'll uh, be with Sergeant Bates for about a week till you get, uh, you know, orientated to what you want to do and how you want to run the platoon. So I reported out there and I went out, the first sergeant happened to be in the rear, and I went out with him and a driver in a Jeep. And they drove the Jeep as fast as it'd go, about 60 miles an hour. And I asked him, old oh, dirt roads and stuff, and through them jungles, I said, why are we going so damn fast? I was in the back bouncing all around. Mm -hmm. He says, in case we hit a mine, Sarge, he said, maybe we'll kick us out for there and it won't injure us. Uh -huh. I said, Lord, what did I get myself into? So anyway, I went out and reported to uh, Captain All Jets, he was uh, in a bunker up there on the hill. Needless to say, I hadn't got there but a few minutes and we got artillery round, or uh, rocket rounds coming in on the base. You talk about hugging the ground now, you hugged the ground when that happened. Mm -hmm. And some of the things are so funny and some of the things you've done was according, according to Army regulations. But it was uh, kind of funny when things happened to you and then you thought about it later well, I could have been killed, or I could have got injured, or I could have lost that man. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so I stayed with Sergeant Bates going around and getting acquainted with the platoon. I got my own roster and fixed it up, a who's who and what. I always kept a, a roster in my little uh, pocket up here and a little notebook of where the man, uh, the age of the man, just about what information you're asking, mm -hmm. where he was from, where he was born, his mother and dad's name and his address in the States and his age. Well, I had one boy, 17, and the rest of them were 18, 19, and I happened to be the oldest man in the company. They started calling me Pop. And uh, 
So, went went there a week, and one night we had a tank and an armored personnel carrier on a bridge down in the valley. And the reason we done that was to keep from the VC coming in and burning because it was a wooden bridge. There was a metal bridge built right beside it that the French had uh, built back in years. It was almost rusted to the ground, but we couldn't use it to withdraw tanks to it. And our other battalion uh, was on the other side of that bridge about 10 miles. And mm -hmm. b between our three battalions, there was a 15 mile gap between us. So there was no such thing as a front line. The enemy's line was all around you. Mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, they got hit that night on the bridge, and Robeson was sitting on top of one of the tracks. After, he was from Texas, and I guess he had raised up, and when he raised up, a uh, VC from, had waded under the bridge through the uh, uh, creek, and they cut the uh, barbed wire was down there, and just fired up at Rob, uh, Robeson. And when he raised up, it hit him in the chest, right here, a little shot group of about that big around. So you know he had, the VC had to be closed. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought maybe, well, they fell asleep, but evidently they had just came through the creek and then fired up, and he was on top of the armored personnel carrier, supposed to be on watch. Well, the tank on the other side turned his gun and started firing over to protect it. By the time myself and Sergeant Bates got down with the rest of the tune, which uh, we raced down there, and we got Robinson on the ground, and Sergeant Bates started giving him a CPR, and I told Sergeant Bates I had a little flashlight with a blackout lens on it, and I shined it down. I said, you might as well give up because you're just blowing air through his body. Mm -hmm. And so we had to call in a helicopter and evacuate him, and the helicopter pilots were outstanding. Boy, if they were a lifesaver. Same with our artillery. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we called it a dust off when you lost a man. So they flew in, lowered it down. Sergeant Bates and I put him in a body bag. We had carried body bags on the tank. And we put him in a... Sometimes. Sometimes it gets hard. Well, no doubt, sir. If, uh, and, if you don't want to go on about that, that's fine. That's so anyway, we, we sent him back. And every, you didn't get in a firefight every day over there. Sometimes you'd go for weeks and weeks and never have a round fired at you. Mm -hmm. So my next uh, deal was we was on a bridge one night and we got hit on the bridge. It was an opposite bridge. Uh, in fact, uh, about two or maybe five miles from that other bridge. <coughs> and I was on the tank and I got off the tank and I heard a hand grenade hit the wooden bridge. And when it did, I jumped up on the tank and it blew right under my feet. Mm -hmm. Didn't even scorch my uh, boots. And uh, I hollered for the driver, traverse the turret, or the gunner. I said, traverse the turret. And by that time I was done in the turret and we started firing right over top of the armored personnel carrier. And uh, one of my men, his name was, uh, he was from St. Louis, Missouri, St. Joe's, Missouri. I thought I'd never, his name was Shufflebean. Mm -hmm. About 18 years old. Well, he got threatened with stuff wounded in the back of his neck. And we couldn't tell whether it was me firing the tank over the top of it because I'd already hollered and told him to button up. But we think it was a grenade throwing up on top of the track and it got him in the back of the neck because he was standing in a turret, you know, with his head about like this. Mm -hmm. And a grenade on top of the tank would have done that damage. Well, we, I called in uh, for a dust off and that helicopter pilot was there within 12 minutes. And he came from Play Clue. That was, 20 some miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, we put him on a helicopter and uh, sent him back. I never heard from him, but I had to sit down for a couple weeks in a row and wait, write his mother's 
uh, write letters to his mother and find out how he was. But he did uh, survive mm -hmm. and uh, was discharged. And uh, my next uh, thing was uh, probably uh, I had sent a tank and an armored personnel carrier back to the rear with a water trailer. Mm -hmm. You always had to uh, have a tank for security and the armored personnel carrier would uh, pull the water trailer. Probably 250 gallon, 500 gallon water trailer. And that's was the it one for drinking? And drinking just, water because you couldn't drink the water over there. It was so contaminated mm -hmm. with Agent Orange. And uh, we took all of our showers and baths and a steel helmet or in a I had a canvas bag I hung on the gun, gun tube that you could heat water in, a lard pail and pour it in, and it had a brass shower head on it. You mm -hmm. could lower the gun and wash up. Two men could get a good bath out of five gallons of water. Mm -hmm. You so got wet, soaked up, and then rinsed off. But uh, I'd sent this tank and uh, armored personnel carrier back. Each platoon uh, where I was dug in on the hill there was uh, three platoons, first, second, and third, and I was the third platoon. And uh, I think Sergeant uh, Saunders, we called him the Jolly Green Giant because when he was in the tank, he stuck out about six foot, <laughs> he was so tall. And the other sergeant was uh, Sergeant Godfrey uh, in the other platoon. But anyway, I sent him back to bring the water trailer and I told him down in this certain valley, don't go through the defile, banks on each side of the road. Uh -huh. Well, when you sent the water trailer back, they had to spend the night in the at play clue, fill up the water can, then wait at the main gate for an engineer outfit to sweep, mine sweep the road. We had to mine sweep every day, mm -hmm. 14 miles of dirt road for mines before anybody could use it. And it was usually 10 or 11 o'clock in the daytime before you got it cleared. Mm -hmm. Well, evidently, the warrant officer was in the engineers. They had uh, went through this defile and they checked for mines. And lo and behold, a VC for the B-40 rocket right from 30 yards away out of a hole. And it went through the armored personnel carrier. It went through the driver's side. It went through his body, come out this side and lodged into a V-6 engine. And that B-40 rocket was a crude weapon but it would penetrate 13 inches of steel. Uh, I got a radio call that they had been hit and they were about a mile and a half away from where I was at. And when I took the rest of the platoon, we mounted up and we got down there within three or four minutes. And we scanned the area and I got off the tank. I put the tank up on high ground where it could see and I got off and the engineer, it was a warrant officer with the engineers, they were still laying on the ground in prone position, waiting for probably more fire or something, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But my driver of that personnel carrier, his name was Holbert. He was from Muskegon, Michigan, 17 years old. But the lieutenant jumped on my tank and rode on the back of the tank down there. And uh, that's how fast we moved out. We took just moved. Mm -hmm. Well, the lieutenant jumped up on the armored personnel carrier and the commander of it was still in the turret with his 50 caliber machine gun, froze stiff, but uh, alive and could talk. Sablock was in the back. He opened a ramp up and had his head sticking out and couldn't find nothing to fire at. So he said, Sarge, I didn't fire. And I said, oh, it's all right. But anyway, I told the lieutenant, I said, lift Hobart out here to me. And then we lift him up with the uh, shirt, uh, the collar here, lifted him out. And when he handed him down to me, you could just see his spine, no body. And I, I turned, I got him on my back, and I run probably 100 yards uphill with him on my back. Mm -hmm. The chopper was there waiting on us, about that's far from the ground. Well, I put Holbert up there, and in the meantime, Huntley was in the back of the track. The medic got him out, he was wounded, and put him in beside Holbert. 
but Hobart's face was just ash gray. He was already passed on. Mm -hmm. And I told my medic, uh, his name was Doc Spivak. Mm -hmm. I said, Doc, get on the helicopter and go with him, even though they had medics. He lay between Hobart and Huntley because they were uh, best of friends. Mm -hmm. Well, we went back and I never seen Huntley again. I had to write Hobart's mother letters for a week. That was a requirement for our company commander. Mm -hmm. And of course he wrote the big letters. Mm -hmm. uh, I just briefly would write of how I knew him and what kind of soldier he was and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Nothing dramatic. But anyway, uh, I never did hear from Huntley, but I'd always got letters for three or four months after the one in uh, Shufflebean got wounded in uh, his mother from St. Louis, or St. Jude, Missouri. I always got letters from her for a long time, and then she quit writing, and I lost correspondence with her. But uh, there's just so many funny things that you've done. Like when we went back one time, we got a shower, first shower we'd had in three months. Mm -hmm. The engineers had set up a shower, big tent, hot water, they had a generator. Well, we didn't have any generators. Uh -huh. I told my driver, I said, when they shut one down, I'm going to be in the shower, and I'm going to take a quick shower and be back out here. You guys get your shower, and we'll wait here on the tank. As soon as they <laughs> shut down the one generator to gas the other one up and let it cool off, <coughs> my crew jumped off the tank, threw that generator on top, back of the tank, and off we took. Uh -huh. Well, we, one of my lieutenant officers had been back to Japan, and he had a little ice box about this big, cost sixty-five, seventy dollars in the PX. Uh -huh. And only one tray of ice cubes in twenty-four hours. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine a bunch of GIs sitting around? We had this uh, generator dug down in a hole with sandbags to keep the noise down, sitting around just waiting <laughs> twenty-four hours for that tray of ice cubes. Uh -huh. They were they were worth a fortune. Mm -hmm. When the colonel would bring him to us in mermite cans, uh -huh. it wasn't ice cream, it was milkshakes. Oh, yes. But uh, we didn't like anything salty. My uh, parents and friends from the States here sent me uh, sardines and stuff. Well, uh -huh. That was salty, you wouldn't know, because water was scarce. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, when we'd pull up on a river or something, the crews two men on, off the tank go down and take a bath in the river and then you had to inspect them and knock the damn leeches off of them. Leeches over there are that big. Mm -hmm. uh, two men would watch out while the t uh, two took a bath and then we'd alternate. We'd do that way but most time we took a, took a bath in a stream or a river and we would uh, go into uh, a mountain yard village, which they were something like our Seminole wind dens in the Everglades. They built her uh, hooches up uh, six or eight feet off the ground uh -huh. and lived in thatched houses, but they would just move in 200 of them and hack a place out of the jungle and that was a village the next day. And they would stay there and farm that with wild rice uh -huh. Not in a rice paddy, but wild rice between the stumps and stuff. They'd hack out, and how they hacked out uh, that jungle with them machetes, I don't know, but they did. And they fought with crossbows. Well, these mountain yards, they didn't like the VC. They uh -huh. didn't like the North Vietnamese. They didn't like the South Vietnamese, but they tolerated us uh -huh. because we did help them. Uh, we'd hire them to put up the Constantina Barbar sometime and give them sea rations and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I survived, we survived for six or seven months on sea rations. Uh, you ate over there. Once in a while you might get a meal out of the mess hall if you was back dug in on Calf Hill. Uh -huh. and, but it was all full of dust where the helicopters would land down and throw dust in the food and everything. Mm -hmm. So most everybody lived on the sea rations. And you ate when you got a chance. You didn't, I'd uh, take a can of ham and lima beans and put it out by the uh, exhaust pipe to heat them up. Mm -hmm. Half the time they'd blow up before you'd get it to eat them because of the high temperature. Uh -huh. uh, was wet three months out of the year, soaking wet, rain three months every day, 24 hours a day for three months. And when you got tanks and armored personnel vehicles moving around, 
uh, the mud's that deep, knee deep. Mm -hmm. And I spent probably, oh, every two weeks, my crew would have to break a uh, track because we'd throw in a track in the jungles on the stumps and everything. We just knocked the jungles down. We went through them like that. Uh, at night, we would fire canister rounds to clear the jungle. This was a 90 millimeter round in the tank and it has about three or 4,000 little razor blades in it. Mm -hmm. It's just like a lawnmower, clear it out because we didn't use what we were taught. I found out that if you kept quiet at night, the VC would try to sneak in on you. Well, at night we'd curl up in a circle. I had a radio, command radio on my tank and out of the time I was there, I had five different lieutenants, so I really never got acquainted with them, but except for the last one, mm -hmm. which was the first lieutenant, and his dad was General I.D. White in Seventh Army Command in Europe. And I knew him in wide Germany when I was on Border Patrol. He was about that high. Uh -huh. Here he's my lieutenant in Vietnam. He was one of the best I had. Uh -huh. But we would circle at night and put the vehicles so tight that you couldn't walk between them. Well, in combat, in Europe, you don't do that. You put them out under a tree, you camouflage net and everything. We bust, we'd bust. line the tanks up, three tanks, and we'd go in a circle until we cleared 100 yards of jungle out. Then mm -hmm. we'd back up and just like they did in the West, corral the wagons. Mm -hmm. And then I'd get on a command radio and I'd call the artillery, which was usually 5 to 12 miles back, the 105s. They were the best. And I would tell them where I was at. I'd give them coordinates and I'd f tell them to fire me a marker around. They'd fire around out in front of me. And then I'd work it in and I'd have the whole crew, everybody would be buttoned up. And you would work that artillery around in until you could hear it hit on the back of the tank. Or all off of the tank. Mm -hmm. Just slightly. Just throw sod up in your face or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well... Then I would tell them to mark that round, and then at night, any time I wanted them to fire, they knew right where it was at. They would fire a circle around me, any time I called it. It may be one round, it may be five rounds, but that way it kept the VC from sneaking in on you. Mm -hmm. And we put out Claymore Mines, the driver and the gunner only. Each man knew where to take his mine out there. You probably heard of them, they're a little mine that's kind of shaped oval with uh, stick legs and you stick them down on the ground mm -hmm. and then you have a charger you run it back to the tank well half the time we didn't have a charger we just stick the wires on a battery in the uh, deck of the tank that's the same way I blew up the caves I would use I didn't have a blasting charge but I had a TNT I would use about at 48 volts in the bottom of the tank but we would uh, I told the guys we learned the hard way one night we put them out and we heard some noise out there so the driver squeezed his charger and the blast come back on us. Mm -hmm. Well these jokers had seen us and laying out there in the jungle had seen us go out and put those mines out in front of the tank. So I thought the next night I'll fix your cookie. So I told the driver I said take a hand grenade, pull the pin, lay it on the ground and put the mine on top of it. I said, then when they pick it up to move it, we'll see who gets, gets it. Uh -huh. That worked very effectively. We also sometimes took a sea ration can and tacked it to a tree, run it, put a hand grenade in with a pin pulled and a wire across the path, and they come down and hit that. Well, that worked real effectively. Uh -huh. I had a monkey that we captured. I had a uh, dove that we captured. I even had the bamboo cage the dove came in. They would stake them out at night, the VC would, and if we came in on them, which we very seldom moved at night, uh -huh. uh, this would warn them. Or maybe they were in the jungle and we were coming through the jungle uh, on foot maybe. Some, a lot of times we had to get off the vehicles and go on foot. Uh -huh. And they would put these monkeys and this bird out for warning. They would chatter and make noise. They had the monkey in a cage? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, the monkey was trained, he'd follow you. Uh -huh. well, so we captured him. And so I signed one man to take care of the bird in the cage, and one man to take care of the, the uh, 
monkey, mm -hmm. and at night we done the same thing then. We put the monkey and the bird out at night, and then we'd go out and get them. Mm -hmm. But we always waited later till just about dark where they couldn't see where you put things. Because mm -hmm. every time you went out and put a claymore mine and it was daylight, they could see where you put them. Well, we'd wait till just to, got dark enough where they couldn't see you do this. Mm -hmm. uh, there was all kinds of things that uh, you done that uh, you probably would do in stateside. At night, I quit smoking when I went over there, but they started giving us uh, free cigarettes. So I sat up there and smoked cigars at night, light up down in the turret and then get out and not smoke. Well, I found out if you opened a, a grill door on the tank for the engine or the, the hatch and made a noise, mm -hmm. they didn't try to sneak in on you because you were awake. Uh -huh. I had one crew that fell asleep. They threw a grenade on it, mm -hmm. but it, it, luckily it didn't go in the tank. No one was injured. So I told them guys, I said, make a little noise, talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I said, they know where you're at anyway. You can't pull a 60-ton tank up in the woods and not, uh -huh. nobody knows where you're at. Yes, yes. Because at night you had to crank up your engines at least eight or ten times at night to charge your batteries on it because the radios went 24-7. Mm -hmm. And uh, my 50 caliber, I was an expert with that. I could, uh, my radios would go out, my company commander would call me and wouldn't know where I was at. I'd play him shaving a haircut, two bits, uh, shaving a haircut, two bits, uh, something about uh, cold grits and stuff, but I'd play that on the machine gun. I'd fire it that way. Uh -huh. Well, that was my signal that the company commander would say, well, I, I hear you, I know where you're at now, uh -huh. because he would be maybe five, six, half a mile from you. Yeah. And then Sergeant Godfrey, his thing was every morning he'd jump out on the back deck of the tank. He had a submachine gun with two thirty caliber rounds of or, uh, magazines with 30 rounds in each magazine taped together where you could release it and then reverse it real fast. Uh -huh. But he'd jump out every morning, he'd press the mic on the radio, and he'd fire off 30 rounds and he'd say, good morning, Vietnam. Uh -huh. See? We'd have went to jail if we tried that, something like that in the States. Uh -huh. uh, there's uh, all kinds of things that went on that uh, you wouldn't realize that uh, took place. Uh, but like I say, I had a tank driver. They sent him to me. Uh -huh. He was an infantryman, straight out of basic training. Didn't know anything. I said, son, I got an infantry squad here. See, I had three tanks in my platoon. Mm -hmm. I had a infantry squad of 12 men. I had a scout squad of 12 men. I had a mortar squad of five men. I had my own combat unit. We could put more firepower out with that one platoon than an infantry company could with a company because we had all the firepower. And normally I found out that we had the upper hand. They avoided us as much as possible. I went into a bunker complex one time. I had to attack it. I didn't hardly fire around. I, I fired a couple rounds out of the tank gun. Mm -hmm. yeah, they were all dug in. I just told the driver, pull up on the bunker, put the tank in neutral steer, and it's just like a drill. Mm -hmm. You see arms, legs coming out. I called the company commander what happened. He said, drive on, keep going. You look back and you just try to forget about it. Uh, found out something else that saved my life. I found out that the, my medic had a cross and a white circle on his helmet and a, wore an armband. Well, when a, my old medic didn't wear them. He carried a rifle, which he wasn't supposed to. Mm -hmm. But when they shoot at you, they don't see that uh, first aid thing. They don't honor that. Mm -hmm. So. I got a new medic to come out, and I told uh, Dr. Spivak, I said, break him in, because a medic, us or a, medic or a mechanic usually rode on my tank. <coughs> I told Sto uh, uh, Dr. Spivak, I said, break him in. Well, he was a conscious objector. So he's not going to carry no weapon. Well, the first fire fight we got in, he asked me, he said, Sarge, can I go back to the rear and get a rifle? And I said, no. 
I said, I have one inside the tank behind the radios. I'll give you. Uh -huh. That's where I carried my 45 because I couldn't hit anything with a 45. A rifle I was expert at. 45, I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. I rolled up my belt up, holster, and put it behind the radio. That's uh -huh. the thing. I carried an M79 grenade launcher, like a big shotgun. Had a whole barrel about that big around, about that long. Uh -huh. it, you wore a vest with the rounds in here. The rounds were about that big and that big around. You had gas, you had high explosive, you had anti-tank, you had the shot, which was razor blades in there. Mm -hmm. When I jumped off the tank, that's what I carried because this jungle is so thick, you can't see hardly anything. Sometimes you could have two tanks going through the jungle side by side, and the only thing you could see is their antennas, or if you got in tall elephant grass. Well, after about being there, probably four or five months, I kept wondering why when we go down the road, I'm always the one getting the fire. I got smart. I was a command tank. I had two antennas on my, that's what they go for, the command uh -huh. or the medic. Mm -hmm. So when I got back to the rear, I took my three tanks over to the motor pole and told Sergeant, I said, I want two antennas on every tank I got. Uh -huh. So when we went down the road, I didn't draw all the fire. Somebody else took a little bit of the heat. Yeah. And we found out that this worked very effectively. Uh -huh. uh, I could probably go on and go on, but... Did, did you know how long you were going to be in Vietnam when you went over? Did 13 you know? months. 13 months? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, actually, it wasn't 13 months. Actually, it was uh, just a few days of being a year. Uh-huh. Had you... Uh, Had you, uh, I'm starting to run on battery on that, but had you um, planned on retiring? I mean, pretty soon when you, when you went when out? I, when I left Vietnam, I only had a year to go when they sent me over there. Yeah. When I left Vietnam, Sergeant Saunders told me, he says, you were put in for a Bronze Star for meritorious service. Well, I didn't think nothing about this. When we came back, I was supposed to be land at Oakland, California. That's where my discharge was. I was getting out. Mm -hmm. 20 years, you had to have over 20 years to get paid for 20. So I had 20 years and 29 days. Mm -hmm. But when I got back, it was exactly 20 years. So what they did, they sent me, we got, our plane got diverted and we landed at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Well, my records are all down here in uh, Oakland. Mm -hmm. So they sent me on administrative leave, and I came home to Weston, and I was down in Tampa, Florida. I already had a job with General Telephone of Florida before he had received my official discharge through the mail. So Westmoreland signed my discharge and sent it to my address here in Weston, West Virginia. I see. But I had planned to stay in 20 years and make it, because my dad always told me, the worst thing you ever done was quit school, and the best thing you ever done is join the Army. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of proud of that. But uh, I never did hear of anything of, of getting any medals. I, I got a uh, service medal of, uh, campaign medal of Vietnam, and mm -hmm. uh, Vietnamese uh, service medal, and mm -hmm. accommodation medal from General, or uh, from Mr. McNamara. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I got that from a lieutenant, uh, wrote me up a letter of accommodation when I was in Germany so long. Yeah. So. Okay, well, um, I really appreciate you taking time to do this interview with us. And uh, Well, I and, didn't think I could do it. And I, I also really, really uh, want to thank you for your service to our country. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm.